Welcome to the fifth module of the course on environmental geography, and I'm Nathan Bowden, your instructor for this course. In this module, we'll be talking about earthquakes. In this module, you'll be learning what earthquakes are, where earthquakes occur, how fault ruptures generate earthquakes, how we measure and study earthquakes, what earthquake hazards are, and how scientists attempt to predict earthquakes. Lastly, how people mitigate earthquake hazards. A quick definition of what an earthquake is, it is a trembling, shaking, or vibration of the earth. Uh, these are um, normally caused by tectonic movements within the lithosphere, which causes these earthquakes, and most of these occur along pre-existing faults. The movements generate seismic waves that travel outward in all directions from the fault. Seismic waves originate at what's called the focus and migrate outwards. Epicenters mark the projection of the focus directly to the surface. These parts of an earthquake you can see in the figure on the right hand side. The red dot, the larger of the red dot is the focus of the earthquake, the, or where the earthquake is um, happening. Uh, along the fault, which is the red line, these, this earthquake, this movement, tectonic movement along the fault causes seismic waves which radiate in three dimensions from the focus. Directly above the focus, is the epicenter, the location on the Earth's surface under which the earthquake has taken place. One of the places where an earthquake can, can occur is a transform boundary. As you recall, a transform boundary are two plates, two tectonic plates, which are moving um, uh, parallel to each other in opposite, opposite directions, as shown in uh, picture, figure C on the right. Um, motions along transform plate boundaries cause many large earthquakes globally, but as we see, not always the largest earthquakes, but many large earthquakes. Transform plates, uh, a good example is the one on San Andreas, the San Andreas Fault on the west coast of North America, which originates in the, um, in the California Gulf through the uh, west coast of California and off into the ocean. So these are two plates which move past each other. The, uh, the, main, Andreas, the main San Andreas Fault is through a basal crust uh, which goes from the Gulf of California um, up to the north of California in what's called Camp, Cape Mendocino. Earthquakes also occur on conversion boundaries. If you remember what a conversion boundary is, when we talked about plate tectonics, you see it here on the right-hand side uh, in the figure 5-4a. The very top you see um, two uh, tectonic plates, which is subducting or going underneath a continental plate. And this is uh, specifically where it's one 9.5 magnitude subduction uh, subduction caused earthquake, sorry, convergent uh, earthquake in Chile in 1960. This also traveled across the ocean, Pacific Ocean to Japan, where it caused a massive tsunami. The largest earthquakes on record have occurred along these subduction zones in the convergent boundaries as one plate slips beneath another. Reverse thrust faults are also common. Earthquakes can also happen at divergent boundaries. Um, a divergent boundary, if you remember, is the pulling apart and the extension of the lithosphere along a faulting uh, between two plates. These normally cause small to moderate sized earthquakes along the mid oceanic ridges, or, or MORs. They pull apart basins, creating rifts which are very are more common on land and are sometimes larger than those in the mid-oceanic ridges. Divergent history can be, uh, be read in the geology. An example of here is in the Basin and Range Province in Nevada, 
of the United States. The Basin Ridge is, uh, is centered in Nevada. And uh, as you see, uh, so in, in, in figure A, you see where it is in Nevada. The, in, in photo B, you see the normal faults occurring between long mountain ranges and intervening valleys. These valleys or basins are caused by this displacement, which again is, is labeled in, in photo C. This displacement of uh, these ridges causes the valleys to occur. And this uh, line where it is occurring is called a fault scarp. Not all earthquakes happen along um, tectonic boundaries. They can also be located in intraplate locations. Uh, an example is shown here in uh, the states of Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Arkansas in the United States. This is along the Mississippi Valley. Um, the Mississippi Valley experiences many small to moderate sized intraplate earthquakes. Intraplate earthquakes are not known for their high magnitude or intensity. Um, however, in this map you see many earthquakes uh, that have happened since 1974 in the middle of the plate. Another phenomenon which we touched on, another phenomenon which we touched on before in uh, plate tectonics was the, the uh, theory of uh, elastic rebound. On the photo on the left, you see a fence that used to be a very straight fence. And again, on the diagram on, under A, you'll see this normal fence line, which had a fault, uh, and in this case, it's a transform fault, going through the fence. The tension between the faults uh, built up, and you see that in, in phase B, Eventually, in phase C, the tension has grown so high that um, the strain is so high that the fault ruptures and one, uh, one large event. And then eventually, the ground on the left is offset from the ground on the right as this transformed faults uh, travel uh, against each other. Elastic Rebound this diagram shows two blocks of crust that are separated by a fault. In the early 20th century, geologists recognized that rocks slowly deform on either side of a fault before an earthquake takes place. This deformation, which is analogous to stretching an elastic rubber band until it snaps, is detected by frequently resurveying fixed locations. The initial survey line, shown here, is straight. The arrows show the relative motion of the blocks of crust. Notice that the survey line bends in response to this motion, but because there is no motion along the fault, the line is not broken. Eventually, the accumulated elastic strain on either side of the fault reaches the yield strength of the fault. The fault moves and the energy stored in the elastically strained rocks is released as an earthquake. The survey line is offset along the fault, but each segment returns to its original straight shape. The term elastic rebound describes the observation that the previously bent survey line returned to its original straight orientation after the earthquake. Creepy faults are very slow moving, moving faults. Here you see uh, in, in figure A is a photo of the football stadium at UC Berkeley in San Francisco, which is, which is quite active for earthquakes. And then B, you see the fault going through the, through the stadium, which eventually will, um, will probably uh, tear the stadium apart. Earthquakes um, have different types of uh, waves. Body waves is one of these types. They, they travel through the interior of the Earth opposed to the su surface of the Earth. So body waves traveling th are th traveling through rock. These can be divided into two, um, P waves, which stands for primary, and S waves, which stands for secondary waves. A primary wave is compressional so that, as you see on the top right-hand side, the way that these um, waves compress, so the P can stand also for pressure, to make, help you remember that, and it travels as 
as a pressure wave through the rock. An S wave, however, are also known as shear waves, and they travel more like you would imagine um, a wave to go through water. However, P waves transmitted, are transmitted through both liquid and solids. However, S waves can be transmitted only through solids. So you may think of an S wave like a, uh, like a wave in the water. However, for earthquakes, S waves, secondary waves, only pass through solids. Conversely, we have surface waves, two different types of surface waves. Um, this is uh, when the energy is converted from underground to the surface. They go through the interior as well on edges. The love waves and rally waves are two different, different types. As you see on the top, a love, a, a love wave travels um, side to side like a snake going uh, along the ground. And a love wave is more of the water, which you, you would see in the water as you, if you go to the beach. Seismic wave motions. Earthquakes generate two basic types of waves. Surface waves travel along Earth's surface, and body waves travel through the interior. Waves move through Earth materials in different ways which enables two types of surface wave motion and two types of body wave motion to be identified, and these are illustrated in this animation. Surface waves vertical. The long rectangular box represents a section of Earth's crust at the surface. The smaller cubes represent segments of the crust that you will watch deform during the animation. The vertical surface wave moves through the block and displaces the surface up and down. Notice that the wave motion decreases as it moves down, so that the bottom of the box does not deform when the wave passes. Surface Waves Horizontal The horizontal surface wave moves through the block and displaces the surface back and forth in the horizontal plane. Notice that the wave motion decreases as it moves down so that the bottom of the box does not deform when the wave passes. Body waves, P waves. Body waves move through Earth's interior, so no surface features are depicted on this hypothetical block of crust. P waves move with a back and forth motion in which blocks of crust alternate between being compressed and expanded as the wave passes through. Watch the changing widths of the black highlighted cubes to see the compression and expansion as the waves move from one end of the box to the other. Body waves, S waves. S waves displace the cubes with an up and down motion as the wave passes through. The motion resembles that of a vertical surface wave, except that the displacement is equal everywhere in the box, whereas surface wave motion decreases downward from the surface. Earthquakes um, are investigated and are measured uh, in basically two different ways. The first of all being satellites in space, which measure the change in the land surface and also the seismic zones, such as upwards or downwards, and the second one is a seismometer. Here you see a seismometer in the bottom right. A seismometer, a seismometer is used to measure the magnitude of an earthquake and also uh, to find the location. The seismometer measures the vertical and the horizontal earth vibrations. A seismogram is the recording, quite often on paper, of the ground motions caused by the seismic waves. Seismographs. Seismographs are instruments used to measure and record earthquake waves. The principle of a seismograph is simple. A heavy mass is suspended from a frame. When the earthquake waves arrive and the seismograph station starts shaking, notice that the frame moves back and forth, but the inertia of the suspended mass causes it to lag behind. The difference between these motions is recorded on the rotating seismograph drum. Notice also that it takes some time for the first earthquake waves to arrive at the seismograph station. 
If the focus of an earthquake is a great distance away, it may take several minutes for the first earthquake waves to arrive. Here we have some, uh, some earthquakes sit, uh, situated next to each other. So the largest, being between 9 and 10 magnitude um, on the left scale, are the one in Chile in 1900 and in Alaska in 1964. Those happened less, and the third one also, just above 9, I believe at 9.1, was the earthquake in Sumatra, Indonesia, which caused um, a horrific tsunami. Those three happen less than once a year. An, an 8 to 9 magnitude earthquake, such as in San Francisco in 1906 or uh, New Madrid in 1812, happened approximately three times per year worldwide. Um, between 7 and 8, which are still quite major earthquakes, causing a very large uh, economic impact and loss of life, um, is the most recently in San Francisco. But also, uh, just under that, you have Kobe, Japan, 1995, and again in California. And as you go down between 5 and 6 on the magnitude scale, uh, you have less severe, uh, moderate earthquakes, which do, of course, cause um, some some property damage. Uh, and uh, but compared to the major uh, seven, eight, nine, or higher earthquakes, uh, they are uh, they are less severe. You can compare these less severe to um, a very strong tornado between a six and seven. This is more an atomic bomb at eight. Uh, magnitude is approximate to a very large uh, volcanic eruption and um, one of the la largest volcanic eruptions was approximately about a nine uh, just under a nine on the volcanics uh, on the on the uh, uh, seismographic scale in Krakatoa but quantifying the magnitude of an earthquake uh, the, also called the Richter scale, or more specifically we call the moment magnitude. This W, this short MW is short for the moment of magnitude, and the M stands for work. It's just a numerical scale uh, that we use to identify an earthquake based on its energy released. It's also calculated by the total area of the fault rupture, how far the rocks move along the fault during the, during the earthquake, as and lastly, the strength of a rock that ruptures. These three aspects uh, are related to a long period seismic wave recorded on the seismograms, and they are a good estimate of the seism seismic energy released. On the MW scale, a change of one, so going from a one to a two or a two to a three, so a change of one represents a change of 31.6 times the seismic power released. Intensity, uh, or the degree of shaking, can also be uh, put on another scale called the Mercalli Intensity Scale. There are then, therefore, two uh, scales that we use, the Richter Scale and the Mercalli Intensity Scale. And again, these, this one is, um, is defined by the amount of damage um, and witnessed, witnessed by the observers, the Mercalli Intensity Scale. The modified Mercalli intensity maps can be made to show um, the intensity of, uh, of the earthquake, not just in one area, but through a very from a larger area. The stars in both of these uh, maps you see on the left uh, indicate the epicenter uh, over which the focus of the earthquake happened along the fault line. The first one is 1906 in San Francisco, it was a very large earthquake, very intense. And not just locally, but uh, also in the region. And in the 1989, a few years before that, the Loma Prieta earthquake, just south of where San Francisco now is. The red area shows the, the highest intensity, so this is between uh, a 9 and a 10 on the modified Mercalli intensity map, intensity scale. Locating earthquakes, you... Um, can analyze the waves, the P waves and the S waves, which are uh, measured by a seismometer. This can identify the, the, the focus and the epicenter of the earthquake. 
you need at least three um, seismometers to to triangulate this center. And these is these measured by the, the travel time. So the P wave and the S waves uh, go through it at different distances. Uh, and these can be measured um, by time when it's felt at these three different locations. Depths of the quakes can also be determined to find the exact focus, not just the epicenter. And this, uh, you need a 3D analysis, knowing the concentration, the amount of, um, of, of ground that's going through. Building design has come a long way uh, in the last uh, few uh, decennia. Um, in A, you see an earthquake in 2003 in the city of Bam in Iran, December of 26. Uh, in the top of photo A, you see before, and the bottom of photo A, you see after the earthquake. Um, this city was mostly mud bricks, uh, so only a 6.6 only is, is, a, is a, still a, a moderate sized earthquake, not a small earthquake, but a moderate sized earthquake. It caused more than 41,000 deaths. On photo B, you see an approximately the same magnitude earthquake in Northridge, California in 1994. And uh, fortunately, only 70, 57 people were killed in this earthquake. This has to do with uh, new techniques in a building. Some more hazards of earthquakes. Um, factors to include are the, the magnitudes, the size of the quake, the distance from the focus, so the origin of the earthquake, and the geology around the earthquake. Um, so different earthquake hazards, including uh, other than falling buildings, include liquefaction. This is when a sandy uh, or um, a, a sandy or or, or silty ground uh, has a tendency to act as a, as a liquid during an earthquake. Slope failure along. Uh, you see that on the right hand side. Slope failure along, uh, along a mountain during an earthquake can trigger rock flow and surface ruptures. Dry compaction and liquefaction. Ground shaking during an earthquake causes loose particles to settle, just as they do when you jiggle a container to settle its contents into a smaller space. Compaction of dry sediment is, however, very different from the compaction of water-saturated sediment. Notice that the sediment grains fill the space to the top of the diagram. The grains touch each other at many points. The greater the number of contact points, the greater the strength of the sediment because of friction and cohesion at grain boundaries. During earthquake shaking, the grains rotate and compact more closely together. They shake down to fill less space in the diagram than before the earthquake. The number of contact points increases, so the compacted sediment is stronger than the uncompacted sediment was before the earthquake. In this part of the animation, you'll see what happens when earthquake surface waves shake sediment grains that are separated by poor water. There are as many grain contacts in this illustration as there were for the dry sediment. Earthquake shaking moves the grains which then pack more tightly together, but the water has to be displaced out of the way. The water rises between the grains as the grains settle. As the water passes between the grains, the sediment particles are no longer in contact, which diminishes the frictional and cohesive strength of the sediment. The whole sediment water mixture then behaves like a viscous fluid, and it is this fluid behavior of the water saturated sediment that is called liquefaction. Surface ruptures can, be, uh, can permanently scar the landscape and cause great damage. On the left, you see uh, a farm which is, uh, it was literally split in half, and on the right, you see a city. Which, whose uh, landscape was uh, permanently altered from an earthquake. And this was in Alaska in 1964. 
a very large danger which caused um, in 2004 a great uh, loss of life is the tsunami. A tsunami, as you see on the figure on the right, is a is a earthquake uh, which normally is uh, underground, uh, especially subduct subducting. Um, and and part B of the figure, the waves uh, travel at very uh, high velocity at 500 kilometers an hour to the beach. As it as it approaches the beach, the wave itself slows down to approximately 45 kilometers an hour, which is still rather rather fast. And at the same time, the um, the height of the wave increases dramatically. Uh, this is on the beach. This is first seen as uh, a recession of the water line away from the beach, and uh, the most devastating part uh, comes next. And this is when the water goes up and over the beach and floods a very large amount of area beyond the beach. As mentioned in 2004, a 9.1 on the on the Richter scale earthquake, the third largest ever recorded occurred on the, off of the coast of Sumatra. Um, approximately 225,000 people over 11, 11 countries died in this uh, tsunami. Tsunami. This animation begins with a view of the ocean floor and its adjoining water column. It also shows a global view from above. In the initiation stage, displacement of the seafloor along an underwater fault generates a tsunami. Notice that the fault movement is vertical, thereby transferring energy to the water column. This release of energy creates a tsunami, which is a series of waves that travels outward in all directions at high speed. In the propagation stage, the tsunami moves through deep water. Although it is moving very rapidly, it has a small wave height and a long wavelength so it passes beneath ships at sea largely unnoticed. In the destruction stage, the tsunami moves into shallow water, which causes its wave height to increase as the energy contained in the entire water column is now compressed. As the tsunami comes to shore, it produces alternating strong surges and withdrawals. In some cases, a surge is noticed first at the shore. In other cases, a withdrawal occurs first. If a tsunami is large enough, it can create massive coastal destruction. This map shows the locations of large tsunami since 1990. Notice that most tsunami are associated with plate motion at ocean trenches. Also notice that most tsunami have occurred around the margins of the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Ring of Fire. Although the 2004 Indian Ocean Tsunami, number 12, was an exception. By rolling your mouse over each number, you can see information about that particular tsunami and its resultant destruction. This page shows before and after satellite images of the same area of Loch Nagar, Indonesia, on the island of Sumatra, near Banda Aceh. Notice that Loch Nagar was almost completely destroyed by the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. Also notice the lack of vegetation in the after image. On close inspection, you may be able to identify a circular white object in the upper center of both images. It is the village's mosque, which was one of the few buildings not destroyed. Here is a photo of uh, an aerial photograph before and after the tsunami in two, of 2004. And as you see on the left-hand side uh, versus the right-hand side, the very all of the land on the north of the aerial photograph is almost completely underwater, and large sections 
in the bottom right to the southeast, I believe, of the of the photo photo aerial photograph is underwater, and um, also large sections on the left. Another great hazard uh, earthquakes are fires. In the photos, you see the fire in San Francisco on the left, which had, which, which uh, lasted for several days. Um, and the San Francisco fire will last three days and uh, devastated 12 square kilometers of the city. A Tokyo earthquake in 23, 1923 also uh, cost tens of thousands of people their lives uh, simply due to the fires. Earthquake predictions. Um, with today's technology, we have been, we've been able to m more accurately predict the size and location and the time of earthquakes, and size and location of earthquakes, but the time is, is very elusive, even today, so we cannot accurately predict earthquakes. It have had very limited successes, um, uh, and such as another other things include animal behavior, if looking at animals, if they, if they um, are acting skittish, then there might be an earthquake coming. Um, Predictions, when we talk of predictions of earthquakes, these are more uh, long-term predictions of it will happen in so many years, approximately. For an, a good example of um, the, the timeline of an earthquake is in northern Turkey, along the uh, North Anatolian Fault. The earthquakes uh, progressed uh, from east to west, so starting from 1939 to 1967. And then there was a very long period of no earthquake, and then uh, suddenly it went back to the very far east in 1992. But then in 1999, and Izmit, uh, there was a very surprising move again to the very far west, showing how unpredictable earthquakes can be. We often talk about recurrence intervals when uh, making predictions. Um, these are coming from records of past earthquakes and, and noting the size of the, of the rupture, which helps, uh, helps to identify when another likely earthquake can occur. But the question of when still remains. Um, so again, we'll look at the recurrence interval, how often an earthquake of a certain size happens in a given location. Knowing this, we've drawn, we can draw maps. Here we have a map of on the left, San Francisco, showing that within the San Francisco area, looking at adding up the different percentages of uh, of probabilities of a magnitude 6.7 earthquake happening within a 29-year interval shows that 62% probability of that happening in that 29 years. And again, this is showed also in on the right in um, in Los Angeles. Uh, and we have had some engineering successes uh, along these faults. An example of here on the right-hand side is the um, pipeline system going across the um, Trans-Alaska, going across Alaska. So geologists had, had mapped the fault location, the size of ex expected earthquakes. Had they done nothing, um, there would have most certainly been some kind of earthquake, which be, as a transformed faults have shown in San Andreas, would snap the pipes similar to the um, similar to the fence in the San Andreas region. Engineers designed uh, a new system, a somewhat like a rail system, so that it would absorb the different um, waves. The pipeline withstood indeed um, a 5.5 meter horizontal displacement, as well as a one meter meter horizontal displacement in a large 7.9. Uh, magnitude earthquake in 2002, November 3rd. Preparation for earthquakes includes a few things. Having a planned emergency response, having an early warning system, providing public education and training for preparedness. Can we also provide a tsunami warning system? In, um, Communication, of course, is a critical 
uh, for a tsunami because as we studied the one earthquake in Chile um, had devastating effect in in Japan on the other side of the ocean even though tsunamis the waves travel very fast at 500 kilometers an hour is still if communications are good would um, would be able to uh, would be able to notify other countries that a tsunami may be coming. However, the tsunami in 2004, which killed uh, 225,000 people, um, the warning system uh, was just not quick enough or large enough to um, to warn people that a tsunami was coming. And this was more deaths than that we've known in recorded history. In summary, we've, um, we've noted the movements and the dynamic geosphere, the tectonics, can cause earthquakes, earth plates, not only along plate boundaries, but also within interplate quakes. Earthquakes present many hazards, in some cases uh, very far apart, such as a tsunami, but also, of course, fires, falling, um, falling buildings, um, liquefaction, and... Um, landslides. Elastic rebound theory explains the relationship between earthquakes, tectonic stresses, and faulting. Seismic energy moves as body waves or surface waves. Body waves, remember, being P waves, primary waves, or S waves, secondary waves. Seismometers record ground motions for seismic waves. There are two scales, the Richter scale, which is also called the moment magnitude scale, measures the, uh, the, the earthquake uh, on the, the summation of the seismic energy released, and the other scale being the modified Mercalli intensity scale. Major hazards, which I've already touched on again, are liquefaction, liquefaction sorry, permanent surface displacements, landslides, tsunamis, and fires. Thank you for attention on this module of earthquakes for the course on environmental geography. This has been your this has been your lecturer, Nathan Bowden.